Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic for today's webinar is an introduction to virtual power plants. This webinar is presented by Clean Energy Group as part of our Resilient Power Project. We have a number of excellent guest speakers with us on the line today. And before I pass it over to them, I'd like to go over some quick webinar logistics. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of today's webinar. You can call in via telephone or you can connect via computer mic and speakers. You can click on the orange arrow that you see circled here to uh, minimize your webinar console. And you can also click on that to expand your webinar, webinar console. And one of the things that you might like to do with your webinar console is to submit questions and comments. We encourage you to do that. We'll be saving some time following our presentations for a Q&A with the audience. And we'll get to as many questions as we can. We do expect to have a lot of people on the line today, so we'll probably have a lot of questions. To make sure that we get to your question, type it in when you think of it. Don't wait until the very end. And a final note, this webinar is being recorded. We'll send you a copy of today's webinar recording and a PDF of our slides within about 48 hours, probably this afternoon. And we'll also post those webinar materials on our website at cleanegroup.org backslash webinars. And that's a good web address to know because that's also where we post information about all of our upcoming webinars in addition to those webinar archives. So with that, I'd like to now pass it over to our host for today's webinar, Seth Mullendore. Seth is a vice president and project director here at Clean Energy Group, and he is going to get us started. Seth, over to you. Great. Thank you, Sam, and, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, as Sam said, we've got a lot of folks that registered, so we expect to have um, a very good Q&A here at the end. Um, so uh, just a quick introduction to who we are at Clean Energy Group. Uh, we are a national nonprofit. Um, you can see some of our generous uh, foundation partners that we work with here. And um, we work on clean energy, advancing technology and innovation um, through policy finance and um, collaborations with partners. We also have a uh, sister organization, the Clean Energy States Alliance, that is a membership nonprofit uh, that mainly works with um, state energy offices and, and other uh, organizations that uh, manage the statewide clean energy funds. So this webinar today is brought to you by Clean Energy Group's Resilient Power Project. The Resilient Power Project uh, has been going for several years now. Um, the goal of the work is really to enable greater access to the benefits of resilient power. In this case, for our work, it's primarily solar paired with battery storage, energy storage um, for backup power. Uh, and we're trying to um, advance greater access, uh, particularly for uh, low-income communities, vulnerable communities, historically underserved communities. Um, we do this through a number of different initiatives. Um, we do work on a lot of policy efforts, we uh, share information and do um, original reporting and analysis that we get out. Um, there's a number of our reports listed down below. We also work on individual uh, project facilitation, trying to get projects actually developed. Um, primarily, we work with folks in affordable housing and then kind of a broader group of facilities that are, uh, provide critical public services, which could be anything from, say, a church that provides community, community services to a food bank to first responders to hospitals. Um, we work with folks at every level, um, from federal to state to cities to local entities um, to help get these uh, policies and programs and projects done. So to learn more about this project specifically, you can either go through uh, the Clean Energy Group website or directly to resilient-power.org for more information, webinars, blogs, reports that we've done through the project. Um, through the Resilient Power Project, we have worked with uh, over 150 uh, projects across the country. Here's a map highlighting a few of those efforts. Uh, we've worked in about half of the states, uh, worked with dozens of communities all across the, the country. And as I said, I think we're actually up over 200 projects that we've worked with now um, and have had successes with, with a number of those actually getting to implementation. So uh, please go to resilient-power.org to learn more about this work. With that, I'm going to introduce our speakers for today. We're very fortunate to have two great speakers with us today. Uh, we have Shada Mitchell and Audrey Burkhart. Uh, Shada is the head of client success for Virtual Peaker, which is a cloud-based software provider that is helping realize the utility of the future through harnessing distributed energy resources. 
She ensures clients have support, training, and guidance to use virtual peaker software, coordinates on program rollouts, and manages device partner relationships. Uh, she has a master's of uh, public Affairs and Policy Analysis and Economic Development from Indiana University's O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs and a Bachelor's in Cultural Anthropology and Political Science from the University of Louisville. Uh, Shada also is a Fulbright alumni and served as an AmeriCorps Vista. She lives in Louisville, Kentucky with her husband and two children. Uh, Audrey Burkhart is a Senior Project Development Specialist for Portland General Electric and works on the utilities, battery energy storage and demand response efforts. Audrey has been in the energy industry for over 10 years with experience spanning the electric and natural gas sectors. She received a Bachelor of Science in Business Marketing from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. And Audrey lives with her husband and two young children in Portland, Oregon and enjoys cakes and biking everywhere. So with that, um, I would like to turn it over to Shada. Hello, everyone, and thank you again for joining us. Um, to begin, we wanted to start with some um, simple sort of definition of what constitutes a virtual power plant. Um, I think in general, there is still a number of um, unclear definitions around sort of this is clearly a virtual power plant, um, and uh, we just wanted to sort of reiterate um, that this is a new space and that the, these are sort of our offering of what they may be um, and that this also takes a lot of different forms whether we're talking about residential or commercial or sort of the scale of a VPP. Um, so can you go to the next slide please? So a, a virtual power plant is uh, in its space a system that integrates several different types of power sources um, to give reliable overall uh, reliability to the overall power supply Sources often form a cluster of different types of both dispatchable and non-dispatchable, controllable, or what's often called flexible load, um, and distributed uh, generation systems. So, but they are all controlled by a central authority. Um, systems like this usually have a number of benefits and ability to deliver peak load electricity, um, thus the name virtual um, peaker plant. Um, and uh, they also, also have a load uh, following power generation, um, typically on short notice, so that they can replace conventional power plants um, while providing higher efficiency and more flexibility, um, and also uh, b react better to sort of fluctuations um, in the grid, and help in general um, replace higher fossil fuel intensive coal-fired um, peaker plants that are sort of older um, generation facilities in a, in a fleet of generation. Um, the, they also tend to require a lot of complicated, um, uh, complex, I should say complex, uh, optimization and control and secure communication. So um, sort of shorthand for what a VPP is, is um, sort of the internet of energy. Um, and, it's, and, and in some ways that makes it a little difficult to sort of pin down exactly what constitutes a uh, VPP because it's not a single physical asset. It's a combination of assets that are easily dispatchable or um, put under command through the internet. Um, uh, and depending on the project, um, you know, whether it's, it includes sort of shared use of residential devices that it also requires a lot of customer communication um, and developing partnerships across um, original equipment manufacturers or what was sometimes shorthand OEMs um, so that there's a support for uh, sharing those devices um, that are out and um, added to the fleet um, for a certain project. Um, I also to note there's a number of regulatory hurdles um, and just in general needing um, of tariffs to support enabling this approach um, one of the more recent orders that came across our radar was at FERC order 2222, um, which is sort of an indication that there is additional support for um, at the federal level and then across different uh, municipalities and different state uh, legislatures and POCs that um, are supporting this type of um, this type of generation or this type of asset. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, and in, this is just to, I think, uh, enumerate a little bit more that BPPs represent, in some respects, the latest evolution in the of, of demand side management. Um, and demand side management, or sometimes uh, shorthand DSM, <laughs> there's lots of acronym soup um, in the energy industry, that uh, is at its very basic beginnings looks a lot like simply shop power, uh, which is in general a very blunt tool um, that gets the job done but has a number of downsides, including high cost to install, maintain, um, and a lot of uh, instances zero connection to the customer. So a customer may have their water heater, for instance, shut off in a high um, energy demand period, but not ever receive notice either ahead of time or at the moment of um, command. Uh, from there, the next stage in evolution was more of a fleet-based design where all like type devices received um, receive the same command um, and events are typically called an aggregate. So sometimes this is called sort of fleet-based to dispatch. Um, and the the downside there is that um, there's you know only a limited number of use cases where this is helpful. A lot of uh, thermostat programs, for instance, have um, approached this uh, in this manner. Sort of the commands that are taken um, are all commands across the whole fleet. Um, whereas now the terminology and sort of the mind's eye, uh, sort of the evolution is taking towards um, simply from just load shedding to more of a load shifting or often called load shaping, um, where the commands in the customer um, is controlled individually. So um, they are given for uh, opportunity to be optimized to grid conditions and to be given high touch um, communication with the customer. Um, there's a lot of different uh, applications here um, across devices. There's varying levels of control that can be applied, um, but the in general the notion is to have a more um, grid connected home and grid connected uh, assets that are responding to signals um, and optimizing on grid conditions um, in a much more fluid and real time basis. And from here, I think I want to pass it off to Andre to talk about the specifics of the project um, that we are partnering with them at Portland. Um, hi, this is Audrey Burkhart. If we could move to the next slide, please. Um, hi, I'm Audrey with uh, PGE, and let's jump right into it to the next slide. I'm going to be talking about the smart battery pilot that we are working on in collaboration with Virtual Peaker. Uh, Portland General Electric, or PGE, is a vertically integrated investor owned utility in Oregon, and we serve about 900,000 customers. Let's move on to the next slide. So before we dive into the residential VPP project that um, the rest of the presentation will be about, I wanted to touch on the broader energy storage efforts that we have going on. There are a number of projects currently underway with energy storage that span the entire grid from generation, substation to behind the meter. So if we're starting looking at the left at the generation plant, PGE has a five megawatt battery that we're working on at the Port Westward generation plant. And it's also being evaluated for the potential to be the grid's black start resource. So in case there was a total and complete system outage, you need electricity to get things back up and running, even to start generating um, more power again. So this battery cited there could be the systems uh, the system's black start, which is pretty interesting. And then moving down the lines to the substation, there are two proposed projects that would provide bulk system capacity as well as locational value at the Coffee Creek and Baldock substations. And then finally, moving on to the right, we have two behind the meter microgrids and the residential smart battery pilot. The two microgrids are sited at community energy resource sites that are intended to be self-sufficient in the event of an earthquake or other natural disaster and will serve as a hub for first responders and members of the community to have access to power and 
communications and everything um, if there was a um, catastrophic disaster. So next slide. And so now if we jump into the residential pilot that we showed with the um, behind the meter pilot, let's go down one more. So the main objective of the residential smart battery pilot is really to just learn as much as we can about how behind the meter storage can and should be used. It's intentionally small scale and is not designed to serve our entire population. We're not quite ready yet. We're trying to look at three pretty large research questions. What is the value to the grid? What is the optimal design of a future scalable program? And what is this experience gonna be like for our customers? So starting at left at the grid, we're operating the batteries to test as many grid use cases as possible and to try and scrape as much value as possible. Other utility programs are kind of just calling demand response events on the hottest or coldest days of the year. But when we looked into that, we quickly found that with our region's economics up in Oregon, Pacific Northwest, this would never pencil economically. Um, the Pacific Northwest has generally inexpensive power, abundant hydro, and we're also not in an ISO where we would be able to sell the ancillary services into the open market. So we found that we have to get pretty scrappy and scrape out every penny of value in these batteries and quantifying the potential value that they'd be able to provide is a key objective of our study. For the program portion in the middle, we're, we're really learning how to communicate with and dispatch these batteries, which devices should be included in the pilot, what incentive levels do we need to set to encourage customers to sign up, and essentially how PGE logistically incorporates hundreds of batteries into our system. So instead of working with, you know, large generation plants, this is now hundreds of batteries behind in a customer's home. And that's a key role that Virtual Peaker is playing in our, um, in our program. And then on the right, equally if not more important than the other two objectives is the customer experience. So what we're trying to learn here is how can PGE ensure that these customers are getting the value they expect from their batteries while sharing it with PGE, allowing us to tell the battery when to charge and discharge. And then in the event of an outage, will they have the power they need to get them through that outage, which is the whole reason for them purchasing the batteries in the first place. Next slide. So the nuts and bolts of um, what this structure looks like, we have a target to reach 525 residential homes, and this will equate to a potential of between two and four megawatts, um, probably depending on how sunny it is, how much solar is um, powering these customer batteries. All of the batteries will be owned by the customer, so the utility is not owning them, as you might see in some other um, programs. And the customer will receive a monthly on-bill credit of $20 or $40 for allowing PGE full access to their battery and allowing PGE to tell the battery when to charge and when to discharge. The amount in that on-bill credit is dependent on whether the customer's battery can only charge from rooftop solar or whether it can also be grid charged. We, um, we modeled that a battery restricted to only being able to charge from rooftop solar has about half the value to the grid and can also not do certain things. Like we wouldn't be able to, if we have excess uh, wind in the Columbia River Gorge that's being generated, if your, sol if your battery is restricted to only being able to charge from rooftop solar, we wouldn't be able to charge customers' batteries with that um, offsite renewable that is overproducing at that time. So that's the difference between the um, on-bill credits. Uh, customers living within one of PGE's test bed neighborhoods are eligible to, to receive an upfront incentive in addition to the monthly credits in order to promote density to test locational benefits and distribution upgrade deferral potential. We also have an income qualified rebate 
being paired with our energy efficiency implementers income that qualified solar program to make sure we're looking at the resiliency needs of a variety of customers and not just maybe um, more wealthy, techie, early adopters. Uh, it was important to allow customers and the market to function naturally. So PGE selected a DERMS platform, which is Demand Response Management System, um, with a broad range of integrated devices. And that was our um, partner's virtual peaker. And so the devices we're allowing to participate in this pilot are Tesla, Generac, SolarEdge, Sonnen, and Sunverge. So we thought that was um, pretty important to us. Next slide. And so this is sort of the architecture of how functionally we're able to, from the utility, tell individual devices when to charge and when to discharge. So you see kind of in the middle there is virtual peaker and they're the software that PGE is using. So going down on that flow chart, there are the individual battery OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, and they each have their own cloud platform and virtual peaker via API is integrated with each of those manufacturing clouds. And then those clouds are the ones who then further down via API reach into every single individual battery home of so all of the people that own a Sonnen, the battery would go from the customer's home up into the Sonnen cloud, then virtual peaker interconnects with them. And then PGE has taken another step, we could simply log on to the um, the web based software and operate the batteries but we've also integrated them into our power operations. So PGE is able to use it as a bulk system resource when needed versus just having it as a web-based software for individual usage. And really the role and the value that Virtual Peaker plays here is um, managing all of those cloud-based APIs and having the, um, the technical ability to go through and do that so we don't have to develop our own software and recreate something that already exists. And with that, I am going to turn it back over to Shada so she can tell a little bit more about um, Virtual Peaker's product and how they're integrated with utilities like PGE to help us execute these um, virtual power plant programs that utilities are working on. Thank you, Audrey. So um, we're really excited about this project with PG&E. They've been um, excellent to um, to bring to bring to fruition. I think the vision that we had when we began as a company. Um, so the specifically for the battery project. Um, next slide, please. There's just a quick intro about uh, Virtual Peaker. We are located in in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Um, we were founded about six years ago by our um, founder and CEO, Bill Berg, who um, sort of came to uh, creating the company with a key idea that the Internet of Things and residential smart devices uh, represented a huge opportunity for utilities to control their costs, engage their customers, and find new business models. Um, after he finished his um, doctorate at Cal Berkeley, he returned to Louisville, Kentucky, which is also his hometown, and the headquarters for GE Appliances, um, where um, Bill helped develop the GE's um, IoT platform. So GE heaters represent one of our first innovations, um, and my technology developed from that period became the foundation for our company. Um, we now have more than 15 different um, probably closer to 20 different device partners now, uh, including some of the uh, world's largest manufacturers of water heaters, thermostats, EV chargers, mini split heat pumps, room air conditioners, solar inverters, and of course, battery systems. Um, and again, we are serving as the software engine um, behind both Portland's program for their um, VPP, uh, but a number of residential DER demand response um, programs across the US. Next slide, please. 
Um, we we are more than just a, a set of APIs. We also sort of, again, um, Audrey alluded to it, have provide a utility interface that allows uh, utility customers to tie together multiple program needs, um, including things like behavioral demand response, um, providing the analytics that are necessary, so, and the not only just the de device control, but um, program management tools and uh, customer engagement um, tools as well. Uh, one of the other key differentiators between us and a number of other um, terms providers is that we um, we also like to say that we deploy in weeks and not months. Um, we in that we're, uh, we're we're able to provide essentially the right size contract for any utility program. So we are very flexible in the way that we um, provide services to utilities, um, sort of reflecting the needs of the project and the program at hand. Next slide, please. Uh, the energy demand um, and integration and the actions that are taken are all, again, via API. So we can, uh, depending on the device types that are needed for a specific program, um, we, we complete the setup, both from a technical and depending on uh, the needs of the utility and from a business relationship management standpoint as well. Um, and so managing things like thermostats, batteries, EV chargers, um, and integrated into the translation layer that is virtual peaker in the cloud, um, providing that real-time analytics and control. Uh, we also can expose what we call our utility API, um, which is part of the, the scope of work for Portland where we are connecting to their system um, and then providing a cloud-based um, user interface, both for homeowners as an option and then the utility interface um, to do uh, any of the control um, for event calling and um, learning more about the uh, events, um, savings, and the and analytics that are uh, embedded within the system. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and again, the manufacturers that we have um, at the table as partners include um, for this program, the Generex, the Solar Edge, Sonin, Sunverge, and Tesla systems. Um, this specific program is uh, focused on batteries, but there's a number of other um, manufacturer and device types that, um, in a in a world where we are able to um, provide the services for all of these types of programs, are um, you know, we're creating an even more integrated layer of control for residential devices. Um, so that in some respects, the uh, the specific the specifics of the manufacturers that are needed for a program are always um, different and different depending on the utility program that we're supporting. Um, and typically, it's usually divided based on the device type. Um, but we're always, you know, looking for use cases where where there's device partners across different device types to see if there's um, additional value and value stacking that we can provide. Um, and that I think is part of the concept of um, uh, virtual peaker plants um, is to be able to harness all of these different device types for, um, for grid services. And I believe that's the um, end of our presentation at the moment. So I think Seth, if you wanted to, um, kick this over to Q&A. We're ready to answer any questions that, that we can. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Jada and, and Audrey. We have a lot of questions, so we'll we'll kick right in. Um, and to anyone that didn't join us at the beginning, this is all being recorded, and we'll, we'll share the, um, the recording and, and the slides uh, probably within the next 24 hours. You should get a, a link to those. So um, just a... Uh, terminology question, uh, this probably goes to, to you, um, Shada, is just the difference between, if there is any, the term virtual power plant versus the, the DERMS, the Distributed Energy Resource Management System. Are those just different names for the same thing, or are there specific differences between the two? Uh, I think that the nuanced difference is that a uh, virtual power plant um, is more broadly also including things like the um, generation. So um, not only just load shedding where you're telling um, a fleet of devices not to consume energy, but also to dispatch. Um, so there's a, there's a, I think, a, a slicing of the atom a bit between those terms. And 
to be honest, there's, I think, in different spaces that I have, you know, have the privilege of working with utilities across the country, they may use one term in place of the other. So I think in, in some respects, that might be um, a question for someone more with more expertise than I do about the the, the terminology, but that was that would ha be how I would answer that question. Yeah, I, I would also say that the VPP is really the what, like the group of appliances, whether it be a battery, a water heater, or a thermostats, and the the DERMS, the DRMS, Demand Response Management System, is the how. That's really the um, the management, mm -hmm. system, the software, or how you are actually um, controlling and managing the VPP. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. And I'll open this one to, to both of you to the extent that you, you have thoughts. Um, a couple of questions came in just asking about uh, FERC Order 2222, the recent ruling on uh, allowing distributed uh, resources to participate more in markets and the effect that that will have on, on virtual power plants. So do either of you have, have thoughts on the potential impact of that ruling order? Um, so, PGE is not in an ISO, so that's we would have to get pretty creative in order to bid some resources into the open market. So I unfortunately don't have much experience with that, but I know Shada works nationally with a large number of utilities that might be impacted. Yes, um, I think the 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 rollout of that order in the sort of the way that it's actually implemented within specific territories and different PCs governance um, are going to help create essentially a new market for uh, bidding into bidding into ISOs and be able to help add additional value stacking for these types of projects. Um, I think there's still plenty of green territory understand how that will operate and what's going to be allowed um, specifically around the sort of responsiveness that's required from devices. So across all of the OEMs that we partner with, there's different um, essentially delay times between when we receive, uh, whenever we send commands and when they're received and then the, the device actually responds. Um, and typically for operating within a specific ISO, you need a very quick turnaround um, where some, some device types may not have that, meet that threshold. So in some respects, um, there's, there's still a lot of open questions, but I do think it's an exciting um, opening of a, opening to a, a different way of operating these types of uh, devices for the grid and for the, the end use customers too. Great, thanks. Yeah, I, I know a lot of the um, the success of the impact will be based on how the individual ISOs and RDOs decide to implement. Mm -hmm. So, um, be excited yeah. to see how that that rolls out. Mm -hmm. um, so, there's a few questions here, uh, Audrey, for for you. I'm going to bundle together. So, uh, first, how did the the virtual power plant program come about? Was this uh, uh, kind of top down PUC or or local or state mandates, um, then how long is the program going to run for? And when it's done or throughout the process, will there be some public results that, that you'll be putting out there? Um, yeah, great questions. So the original, um, the original nexus of PGE's battery storage efforts was uh, Oregon House Bill 2193 that was passed um, a few years ago, I think maybe 2017 or somewhere around there, potentially even earlier. And um, the Oregon House bill directed utilities to propose a minimum of five megawatts of energy storage as part of their operations. So it was a directive to us. And then from the House bill, that prompted the Oregon Public Utilities Commission, our PUC, to do a rulemaking of what that would look like and how we would do it. And then once the rulemaking was complete, PGE had the ability to go and do that. Um, the, the residential pilot is not cost effective. And I, I kind of mentioned the struggles we have with the valuation of the use cases and trying to really 
shore up all of the benefits that we can realize out of that. So we wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been able to do something like that, a non-cost effective um, research project without permission from the PUC who had to receive permission from the legislature from the state of Oregon. So um, it is kind of an interesting way that it came down to basically allow us to spend this money non-cost effectively in order to study and research of how we can use energy storage on our system. Um, it's a five-year pilot. So I um, we had to receive approval of a customer tariff in order to do this. And the duration of the study is five years. And um, almost everything that utilities do are public, especially if they're uh, regulated by the PUC. So we will be posting annual reports every single year on the um, uh, on the progress and our learnings from this. If you are the kind of um, energy nerd who likes to read PUC filings and search their website like that. Well, we'll plan for another webinar maybe so you can distill some of the, the results from that. I'd love to be there. <laughs> Great. Um, Shada, interesting question, uh, asking about just the the level of, of metering infrastructure. I assume this means it's as far as smart meters deployment through a utility territory. How, how does that affect the ability of, of Virtual Peaker to provide its, its services? Uh, we can deploy a program, support a program, depending on the, the needs of the utility without AMI. Um, AMI has typically been used um, in order to see from the, from the utility's sort of measurement verification vantage point how effective a program is. Um, depending on the device type, uh, we do, so for EVs and batteries, for instance, um, there are some um, oversight bodies that accept that as a uh, meter grade data. So when we see, the, we can estimate using a baseline to see what the um, the difference is when there's a load shed event or a load shift event. Um, but for things like, uh, for that's for instance, you may need runtime data, um, which for some device manufacturers we do not receive. So having AMI data coupling it with that actually helps provide some of that um uh the data that's necessary to, to to arrive at a conclusion of the the efficiency of a program um but you know i think ami is always a valuable asset to have um whenever there is a, a large scale program to be able to to see what's um what's happening and if you're you're running things um in a cost effective manner does that answer the question Great. Yeah, I'm yeah. Not sure, I, there's I a follow up. <laughs> no, 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 no okay. follow up to that. There's, there's a, a kind of a okay, sort of related question, um, and this is more about just um, someone who's pointing to the fact that that states that have have worked to get more distributed energy resources and microgrids, places like California and and Hawaii, um, that they're just pointing out that there are a number of complaints that somehow some of the um, the rules and rates and, and tariffs have been set up that they haven't been effective at um, always incentivizing or properly incentivizing resources. Uh, so I guess the question mm. is, you know, are there good examples of the states that, that are doing a really good job of this or, or do you disagree that um, you know, places like California and Hawaii are, are doing well? Oh, man. Yeah, that's a difficult. Yeah, <laughs> that feels Small like a. That feels like, yeah, I'm not sure that that that's um, within my scope of being able to answer. To be frank, I think that there's a lot of different. Um, there is a number of different people that probably have more expertise in the regulatory and the rate making that could speak more um, specifically to that kind of question. Um. So the person who asked the question might be alluding to, I think, uh, was it Arizona and Hawaii who removed net metering from their solar, solar generation? And I mean, I can't say whether, whether it's good or bad, but all of this is pretty complicated. And utility regulation is, I mean, it's hundreds, of, we've been doing it the same way for hundreds of years, and it's not really set up in a way to reflect 
power coming from customers' homes and these all of these new concepts are pretty cutting edge and utility regulation hasn't really caught up with it in the way that I think people would like to see. And balance, um, you know, all ratepayers cannot be subsidizing one person's rooftop solar. You have to make sure that the the value and the balance is there in an equitable way so that, um, you know, the people who can least afford solar panels for themselves are not subsidizing in their electricity rates wealthier people who do have solar panels on their roofs and so it's really about a balance to try and make sure that um everything remains fair and the entire system is benefited by um utility programs not just specific people so um yeah i don't know if i really have a great answer for that i think you could ask 100 people and get 100 different answers of what they think is the right thing to do yeah, definitely. No, I appreciate the, the response. Um, speaking of, of, of balancing customers' needs, uh, there's a question about um, how homeowners' needs are, are balanced through the program. So what if there's conflicting interest as far as what the customer wants to use the battery for and what uh, PGE wants to use, use the battery for? Um, and related to this, too, is it's just a question about um, is there any ownership issues that come in, in, into this? Is PG&E taking any ownership claim over the batteries? Great question. Um, PGE is not owning the batteries. The customer is simply allowing us to manage the battery on their behalf. So um, we are, for this study, we're disabling the customer's usage of the battery, except in the event of an outage where the battery will um, automatically provide backup power and island the customer's home. But um, the customer cannot use it for time of use bill management or for their own needs. Uh, PGE will be using it uh, for, for system needs the entire time. That doesn't mean we're gonna be like continuously dispatching it but we are the ones who have the ability. So it kind of takes away that conflicting use cases that you mentioned, where if a customer is trying to charge and we tell it to discharge, what does it do? We'll have management of it um, for the duration of the customer participating in the program. And we're paying them the $20 or the $40 per month to make sure that um, we're compensating the customer for what they would have realized by trying to do bill optimization through time of use rates themselves, as well as to say, um, you know, hey, thank you. This is what the value of your battery is to our system. So we're making sure that they are not um, financially harmed by allowing PGE to use their battery. And then we will operate it in a way to make sure that for any, um, for any outages that we have kind of a chance of predicting. So if our if PGE crews are put on standby, we say there's high winds, there's ice, there's a higher likelihood of a power outage, we'll proactively charge the batteries ourselves to make sure that um, if there's an event of an outage, the customer has the highest chance of having a full battery so that they can um, ride out through the outage until we're able to re restore power. Obviously for like car hit pole or a squirrel up there, we can't really predict that, but neither would a customer be able to predict that if they were using it themselves. Great, thank you. Squirrels, a uh, surprising amount of <laughs> outages. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is a very good question. Um, is this, what does the, the community outreach look like to, to sign up homes for this program and, and how's that being impacted um, during COVID? So um, I don't think 2020 has gone quite how any of us predicted it would in January of this year. So we've had some pretty, um, it's been an interesting year to put it mildly. We are starting our outreach by, by proactively contacting everybody with an existing battery device in their home and inviting them to participate. So we'll pre-qualify them and then um, send them an email 
and say, click on this virtual peaker link and enroll your battery if you'd like to. Um, Oregon was very heavily affected by wildfires, as um, I'm sure most of you have heard about. And so we had to pause our outreach. And actually, today, this morning, we were doing a second big push of outreach to um, invite customers with existing storage to participate. And then once we kind of collect all of the existing battery owners, we'll start working through, um, make sure that our solar trade allies know about the program and are able to help inform customers as they're in their homes working on um, solar panel installations or battery storage for a customer to um, kind of point them toward the program that this is something they'd be interested. We're also doing marketing outreach to um, reach out to customers who have solar but no storage and let them know about the opportunity or who have no solar and no storage, but our, um, you know, our marketing efforts have identified them as a potential person who might be, um, you know, our marketing profiles, they may be interested in solar and or storage. And I think with COVID, there's an increased focus on resiliency, sort of like there hasn't been before. Um, in Oregon, our big concern is the Cascadia subduction earthquake, which is a massive earthquake that experts say is, is coming sometime. So everybody is trying to make sure that our systems, systems are hardened for this and that people um, are prepared for the event of this very large earthquake. And I think after COVID, you know, people now have water and supplies and spare food like they didn't have before. So there's kind of this, um, you know, it takes something that's imminent and right at your doorstep to really get people to act and be prepared for, um, you know, for the unexpected of what life can throw at us. And I think there's a renewed focus on resiliency and people are very interested in solar and storage and especially with the wildfires and PGE's first public power safety, public safety power shutoff that we have never had before. Suddenly this issue is really right at our doorstep and people are really, um, you know, taking notice and preparing themselves. Great. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Shada, I'm going to direct this one to you. The, the virtual peaker, a peaker is in, in the name of, of your company. Um, a number of people are, are wondering, just as far as the effectiveness of, of virtual power plants in, in displacing fossil resources, and particularly peaker plants, um, you know, do you, can you point to any examples um, where utilities are specifically deploying this in, in displacement or displacement of, of peakers or, or for replacement strategies? and you know, how does, if you can, is, is there any sort of rule of thumb for, you know, how how much in the way of distributed resources or what mix uh, is effective in, in displacing a certain amount of, of, of fossil generation or, or peaker generation? Is there any sort of ratio there as far as megawatts to megawatts? Um, I, I don't think that there's a clear sort of consensus on what that would be just yet, but I do know that in areas where there's uh, regulatory um, frameworks for non-wires alternatives, that these types of programs tend to make more um, economic sense and tend to be more um, more readily or enthusiastically pursued. Uh, the idea there being that if there's a, a regulation that that sort of incentivizes not building any additional um, generation uh, assets, then looking to this as an alternative becomes much more effective. Um, I do think that, again, this is still a very green field um, in terms of a lot of the work that we're doing is very cutting edge and bleeding um, edge, especially when controlling residential devices. Uh, there's a lot of um, still uh, kinks to be worked out, <laughs> for sure. For instance, you know, even understanding what sort of incentive to provide to customers and managing um, the program components of it do require uh, effort that is still, um, you know, I think understanding the best way to do that is still um, still yet to be seen. So there's some there's some 
inability, I think, for me to say clearly this is the, the megawatt or capacity that's needed in order to replace a, um, a typical generation uh, facility. So, um, and again, I, this is also just speaking to the types of programs that we support tend to be more on the residential side. I do know that there's uh, thinking elsewhere that this is also, you know, a, a virtual power plant or peaker plant may also be considered um, sort of a larger assets or larger mix of um, even commercial industrial uh, demand response um, and whatnot. So in some respects, um, this, this space is still researching to answer that question is probably the, the summation of, <laughs> of the answer there. No, thank, thank you. Yeah, so that's, that's good to know. Um, and, and for any folks that are listening that are working on this, uh, just to plug the, the Clean Energy Group does a project focused on uh, distributed resources, solar and storage for the phase out of, of peaker plants, um, specifically in, in urban environments. So feel free to reach out to me about that as well. Uh, so a, a question, does, does virtual peaker ever work on the customer side of the meter as well? Is it only on the utility go-between or do you also provide customer services for management, um, you know, maximizing value or, or working on microgrid controls? Uh, we currently don't have um, a microgrid uh, project, but I do know a lot of the, a number of our clients have used what we call our homeowner interface, where we're sort of providing um, an additional sort of layer that's typically branded the utility for the customer to engage. Um, in the program and in the the device control on um, the demand side management programs that are being sort of exercised on their homes. Um, as far as sort of providing uh, sort of customer management, a lot of the focus has been on um, providing just high touch communications, so automatic emails, event notifications. Um, we support SMS, so if a customer rolls and provides their um, their phone number, um, sort of providing sort of with all of the sort of um, permissions that are granted um, when the customer signs up and says, yes, this is fine to text me, then we, you know, we provide that kind of support as well. Um, the, the partnering with a number of our utilities or what we call our program implementers, we, we again think of ourselves as the software solution. So a lot of the um, management of that is really dependent on the project and dependent on who else is at the table to assist. Great. Um, and this is an interesting question. Is virtual power plant, can one exist without utility precipitation? Um, it seems like it would be difficult to structure it that way, but I'm not sure if either of you have, have thoughts on that. Yeah, that's an interesting Interesting thought. Um, I do know, you know, some some deleted spaces that there's, uh, you know, retail um, utilities that are interested in using services like ours, where um, you know, customers that are trying to uh, save their save on their bill by um, sort of having their rate more mirror the wholesale cost of energy um, or the ISO then the retailer will you know use a service like ours to help um, provide those types of services but I'm not sure if it would take the form that the question is asking I do there's there is interest in um, sort of supporting that that um, that type of framework where you're sort of disintermediating the, the, the traditional utility. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, that's good to hear that there's at least some, some movement there. Um, that'd be interesting to see how that comes together. Uh, so for uh, Audrey, a question is, what, what are the metrics you will use to, to measure the, the success of, of this pilot? Um. Well, I mentioned the the items we were trying to study, the grid, the program, and the customer. I think for me, there's no success or failure. It's all about learning and understanding, um, understanding this product and the potential. So um, for me, I think success is getting enough customers enrolled so that we can test the things that we're trying to test. We have um, a lot of 
really good and really smart engineers working on this who are doing um, like grid use case optimization and doing um, use case stacking to see what the highest value of these batteries are and how can we um, you know, potentially use customer batteries for things like distribution upgrade deferral. So instead of um, spending money to transformer, what if we could use batteries to reduce the load during peak times in a way so we didn't have to upgrade that transformer? And just getting enough participants and enough information to be able to study those key objectives would be my my definition of success. But if customers don't sign up, that's also a finding. That's also a learning. What do we need to do differently? Let's talk to these customers and let's understand what's not working for them. What would they need in order to participate in a program like that? So um, the great thing about R&D is that there's no failures. There's only learnings. And as long as you understand and um, you know are open to listening about what you're seeing, then that to me is still a success. Audrey, I had a couple of questions come in just about when you were talking about the, the value of the energy storage system as far as being paired well, exclusively with solar charge, exclusively with solar versus um, the grid and solar. Could you elaborate just a bit on, on why there, there's there's the less value, I believe, from um, those systems only charged from, from solar. Mm -hmm. So there is a federal tax credit called the uh, Solar Investment Tax Credit, commonly shortened to ITC. And it is a tax credit for uh, the installation of solar panels. The IRS ruled that customers also purchasing storage were eligible to receive this tax credit. It's um, on a step down schedule right now to be phased out, but it started at 30%. So that is a major benefit and a major uh, financial, um, financial benefit for the customers installing solar and storage. But the storage had to be physically restricted to only charge from that solar in order to take that tax credit. So um, if you have a battery on, you know, in your house, the literal electrons from your solar panels can only be directed into the battery and it is not allowed to be charged from the grid in any way or else you're not eligible for that ITC credit. So now in a place like um, Portland, which is, I don't know if you guys have ever been to Portland in the winter, but there's not a lot of solar electricity being generated on our customers' homes. It is very dark and dreary for a significant portion of the, um, of the winter. The capacity that's gonna be present in those batteries to provide power back to the grid during a peak event, you know, a really cold morning, those batteries are gonna be pretty darn near empty because they can only be charged from your rooftop solar. And if your rooftop solar is not, um, is not generating, there's nothing gonna be going into the battery. So people who have received that tax credit and whose batteries are physically restricted from charging from the grid, there's, we modeled and there is about half the, um, half the value and that's a function of capacity that the battery will have, but then also the different use cases. So um, if we wanted to test load following, we could not do that because we can't store our, re our um, power into your battery. So um, if there was abundant hydro and there's so much hydro, it's really mild, we're gonna have to spill the dams in order to um, have something to do with all this pent up water we could charge all of the batteries on the system with that excess hydro, but we cannot, and then store it there for when we need it on a, um, you know, a less mild day. But if we cannot push battery, if we cannot push power into your battery, we cannot do that. So there's just less value to us if we can't do a two-way flow versus the um, passive charging of rooftop solar PV. 
Great. Thanks. And it looks like we are out of time here. So I want to just take a moment. Thank you, uh, Shada and Audrey, uh, for the great presentations and, and answering all the questions. I know there are a ton of questions we did not get to. So, so folks, please feel free to reach out um, and we can, can get your, your questions directed to the, the right party. Um, with that, I am going to thank everyone for joining us today and, and hand things over to Sam for uh, just a little bit of information about some upcoming webinars that we have. Great, thanks Seth. Um, so we do have a couple of webinars coming up that might be of interest to the people on this call. Um, one coming up next Friday on the energy storage system on the island of Nantucket, and then uh, later in October, that is supposed to read, I'm sorry, that's supposed to read October 20th. Um, sorry for that mistake, we have another Resilient Power webinar. So you can learn more about those webinars on our website, cleanegroup.org backslash webinars. You can register there, and we hope to see you there. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you for having us.